Placidly standing on a bed of lilies, Guadalupe is for Hilda, and now for her charge, a powerful woman who protects those who fight for their passions. That's a pretty subversive message for a young female narrator to hear and for Hilda to proclaim because both the narrator and Hilda were expected to conform to very sort of rigid gender and class roles. For the narrator, Rosario, this meant aspiring not really to an education, but more to be like a society wife, right? Forever pure and holy and hosting very fancy teas. For Hilda the nanny, the expectations were far more extreme. Her family's poverty made it nearly impossible to fathom any kind of education or any sort of liberation from the life of poverty to which she was surely doomed. And you can bet that there's like a racial thing going on here too. You saw Rosario's very light skin. I guarantee you that Hilda didn't look like that. And yet, at the end of this short story, neither woman has conformed to the norms expected of her. Hilda improbably is able to leave the island. She completes an education here in New York, of course. She becomes a nurse, and the narrator gains the courage to leave and come to boarding school and college in the US. Ferrer's story ends with this observation on the part of the now adult narrator. She says, Hilda's life had been heroic. I want to focus here on the juxtaposition of Hilda, right, a victim of the double rejection of being a woman and a Latina of the lower class in Puerto Rico and here in the mainland US with the heroic virtue of Guadalupe as understood by Hilda and by the narrator, a powerful virgin who protects those who fight for what they want. What Hilda wanted for herself and for her young charge was to break away from these expected feminine roles and into a life of one's own, a life for Hilda marked by love and passion, but also education. Both Hilda and the narrator wind up finding this by leaving their homeland and seeking out something new. In showing us their subversive prayer and teaching in the context of devotion to the Guadalupe in Ponce's Cathedral, Ferret ties popular pra Catholic practice to goals that would be characterized as feminist, right? the self-actualization of women, their education, and their capacity for self-determination. This is my kind of story. Right? In a number of ways, it is my own story. And in all its particularity, rooted in, I don't know, the 40s, the 1950s, in a small city in the south of Puerto Rico, it reveals itself to be the story of many women. I want to end this evening with a little bit more art by Yolanda Lopez, a Chicana artist based in Southern California. Interestingly, she and Ferre belong to the same generation, but they never met. They both paint pictures of subversive Guadalupes, right? Ferre with words and um, Lopez um, with sort of collage. You uh, have now seen the classic image of Guadalupe. And here's Lopez's take. <laughs> She got a lot of flack for this. And so did I when I put it on Twitter last December, innocently. <laughs> a lot of people were all up in my mentions about this, about how sacrilegious it was. Um, I think it's the thighs. Definitely Guadalupe is not supposed to have thighs. Um, it's, but you know, look at her. <laughs> Many people are deeply disturbed to see Guadalupe depicted as a strong woman, a runner. Look at her shoes. Um, in running shoes, she's got a shawl behind her back. She's strangling a snake. I mean, come on, right? She's dynamic and she's forceful and she's coming right at you. It looks to me like a depiction of the Guadalupe that Hilda is praying to <laughs> in Ferre's story. When I discovered these, in the course of my research, right, you know, like you go down these internet rabbit holes, like, I know I'm writing about Guadalupe, maybe I'll just Google it and something will come to me. Uh, I couldn't believe the synergy between this painting and Ferrer's story. Here's my favorite of Lopez. She does a triptych, but this is uh, my very favorite. This is uh, Lopez's mother, Margaret Stewart, as the Virgin of Guadalupe. She looks exactly like my grandmother, who also had a Singer sewing machine. Hers was olive green, but it, was, it looked exactly like that. The lamp was the same, the, the things of thread stacked up were the same, the table is the same, the material sliding off the table, the same. She had the same haircut, the same build, the same look over her glasses, right? It was like looking at my own grandmother. Maybe it looks like someone you love. What amazes me 
is that this very particular image, right, it's her, her mother, revealed so much to me about my own grandmother's everyday holiness. Imagine if we saw our grandmothers painted as saints in all their heroic virtue. Particular narratives, especially literary narratives or art, whose beauty lies in their capacity to represent reality in fresh perspective, highlight the unity and diversity that is and has always been a mark of the church. To my mind, the faith of ordinary people is embedded in narratives like these. In a particular way, the work of Latina authors like Ferre and many others allows us to glimpse what anthropologist Ada Maria Diaz Stevens, also New Yorican, has termed the matriarchal core of Latinx Catholicism. In the story of Hilda and her charge and their interaction with Guadalupe, we see hints of catechesis, of cultural retelling, of the interaction between popular culture and popular religion. It is in these intersections, I believe, that the Holy Spirit resides, that grace erupts, that the story of the church gets told. Consequently, by analyzing these narratives, theologians can discover the sense of the faithful, that infallible intuition of faith that belongs to the whole people of God. The story of the people of God, which I think is what ecclesiology is, is enriched by and transmitted through well-told stories like Ferrez. It makes their experience count. The reality of Latinx people in the US is complex, the history is long and riddled with conquest and with violence and with cultural appropriation. The demographic story of American Catholicism continues to shift. Our church's gaze is turning southward. Our churches themselves turning more and more Latinx. In this time of flux, we cannot forget to ask whose experience counts and how do we go about counting and accounting for the experience of the marginalized and the excluded in our midst. Cuéntame is my approach to an initial accounting, but it's also a threefold invitation. I want to hear about American history without leaving anybody out. I want to hear about some well-told stories that highlight the roles of women in catechizing, in passing on the faith, and in developing doctrine. And finally, I want to hear your own stories that in so doing we can recognize the unity and diversity that binds us all into one people of God. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for a few questions. If you would like to ask a question, I didn't ask if you would take questions, but hopefully you will. <laughs> I will now. now <laughs> please uh, raise your hand and uh, um, tell us who you are and briefly state your question or comment. look divine or quasi-divine. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Mary isn't God. No. You know, every good Roman Catholic theologian <laughs> is clear on that point. But I think especially, but not exclusively for women, mm -hmm. She often, in many communities, in many times in history, has kind of functioned like God. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't envision God. And I, what, at a sewing machine? Yeah, at a sewing machine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Looking like my mother-in-law. What if God made the world like that, Barbara? <laughs> so, do you want to say anything about the power of Guadalupe that 
this actually came up in the seminar uh, this afternoon, right? This, this, the how large Marian devotion and Marian apparition looms in um, Latin America and Spain, but I think in Catholicism generally. Um, I think one reason why there's a proliferation of Marys and there's so much attachment to Marys is that all of these apparitions or cultural expressions of Mary allow communities to graft their story onto the story of the church in life-giving ways, right? And the church enculturates or acculturates, I don't remember the difference right now, through that, right? It, it makes that happen, right? It gives you ownership of the faith in a very real way. I think Guadalupe is sort of transcendent, well, more so now, because again, Guadalupe functions in that Latino identity, right? And John Paul II did a lot in naming her the, the Queen of the Americas or whatever. I was actually at a conference at Notre Dame when that was proposed, and there were many bishops from Latin America there, and they were not chill about that option. <laughs> they were actually very insulted because they viewed it as yet another colonial move. Like, no, 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 we have St. Rose of Lima. I don't want Guadalupe. <laughs> or no, 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 we have Our Lady of you know, Caridad. We don't want, like, why does she have to be the Queen of the Americas? We have our own, right? And so I think Guadalupe looms a little larger maybe here <laughs> because it fills that Latino, that kind of the fantasy of this monoculture that doesn't exist. Nevertheless, I get your point about the importance of women seeing themselves as depicted as divine, right? Or be, seeing themselves in God. And it's a double-edged sword, right? The more divine, this is an insight from Elizabeth Johnson, the more divine we make Mary, the more masculine we make God. And God is utter mystery. So we need to be really careful about that. At the same time, we can't deny the power of, especially images like this, to awaken us to the way in which grace is operative in the world, right? I loved the idea, you know, because everyone thinks their grandma's a saint, <laughs> right? I'm sure, well, maybe one of them was a saint. Maybe, there's always like a mean one and a nice one. <laughs> mean one and a nice one. There's, right, I had a mean one and a nice one too, but the nice one is this one. Uh, we always think our grandmas are saints, right? But then to see that, like to see someone who looks so much like her, totally depicted this way, drove it home in, uh, at a level that I didn't know I needed mm -hmm. to see that and, and then to be able to imagine Mary's real life, right? Sewing, feeding, washing clothes, you know, mending or darning or whatever. That kind of helps us to take note of the ubiquity of grace among the people of God, and I think that that's a fundamentally um, important thing that we can bring along, right? Thank you. Another question. Leo. American. Hi, thanks, Natalia. Hi, Leo. My name's Leo. Um, Talking about disruptive narratives and ecclesiology, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, as you know, the Our Lady of the Amazon statues were thrown in the river in Rome while the global church is trying to take an account and count a part of the church that is very much at the margins and it's mm -hmm. raising a lot of questions about who is the church, uh, what story is told, what stories are allowed to exist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you can say something about the disruption that took place there, because it's perhaps a mutual disruption, but mm -hmm. the violence that takes place within those narratives. Mm -hmm. um, and I very much appreciate the, the emphasis on whoever tells the story, you know, very much controls the people. Um, yeah. so. Thank you for yeah. bringing that up, Leo, because I had a spot where I thought I was going to talk about the Amazon Synod and I didn't. That has been so revelatory, hasn't it? People are freaked out. And the best part is that they named, so there was this statue, right, this Amazon Synod. People from the Amazon brought these symbols, religious symbols that they use, whatever. You know, they brought it to the Vatican and it was kind of revolutionary because finally something from the New World is entering the sacred halls of the Vatican. This is amazing, this is awesome. A little exoticizing, but whatever, we're gonna let it slide. And in this moment, there's a, there's a, a carving of an indigenous woman, right, with um, sort of face markings, like paint, and she's naked and pregnant, right, very clearly pregnant. You see a fetus in her womb, right, in red, so it's very, you know, obvious what's going on. 
And somehow the professional Catholics in the social media world named this thing the Pachamama, which it is not. You and I were at the Cusco Cathedral on the feast of the Pachamama, were you not? Yes. I have seen the way the feast of the Pachamama gets incorporated into a Marian feast. I don't remember what it was. It was like Our Lady of Sorrows. It was some totally minor Mary that was suddenly really important in the Andes. We know what's going on, and that's fine, right? It's totally fine. Um, so they named it Pachamama because that sounds really scary and indigenous, doesn't it? It definitely doesn't sound Catholic. So that immediately became the name of that statue, and then it needed to be cleansed, right? Because God needs to be protected from our defilement somehow. And so these you know, heroes took it and threw it in the river. Right? And literally, like, it's very violent to drown a pregnant lady, even a carved one. Um, and many other thoughts on that, which I will pause because we're being filmed. But the idea that some other culture might have something to teach Rome about Catholicism was so disconcerting that it needed to be killed, right? extinguished, drowned, right, in a very violent way. And Pope Francis, to his credit, apologized, right, um, called it an act of violence, right, noted that there was, that some people were laughing at the headdress of some of the indigenous guests at the Amazon Synod and that the, those headdresses were no less ridiculous than half of the things that the bishops were wearing. <laughs> Which is true, right? It's just what headdress are you more comfortable with? Which have you seen more, right? But everybody, like, look at the Swiss guards. Do you think those things belong in the Vatican? That's not Jesus, right? That's an enculturation too. It's a weird outfit. You might even say that Catholicism is filled with weird outfits. <laughs> Something about those weird outfits, though, really set people off, right? And it reveals to us what sorts of narratives we need to hear more of, right? A second moment, I think, in that synod, I don't know if you're like me and you wake up to the tweets from the Vatican press pool every day, I do, um, was when one of the women religious who was working in the Amazon just kind of matter of fact, is like, oh yeah, I hear confessions. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't give them absolution, but I hear the confessions and I witness at marriages. There's nobody else there. And you're like, what are we fighting about here? There's a whole other church that has moved beyond this paradigm and is just living it. And here we are like, mm, do you think? I don't know. Like, can maybe, can a woman be a lector? I don't know. Can we have girl altar service? Jeez, what are we going to do? You're like, there's no time to think about it. Right? The church is already incorporating these other ways of being alive and staying alive and giving people the sacraments and making them feel like part of a community. Right? That, it doesn't look like the way that people in this country feel like they're part of a community does not make it any less valid. Right? Quite the opposite, it might enrich our understandings of community to learn from these other places. Right? One of the insights from uh, Dia Stevens that I love that she talks about when she moved to New York from, her, she lived in rural Puerto Rico, like in the, in the rainforest. And to get to church, which she would do once a month, she had to wear her very nicest dress, go down a mountain, through like a, a stream, by picking up her dress and taking off her fancy shoes, through the stream, and then walk like another half mile to get to church. Right? There's no such thing as a Sunday obligation when that's your trek to, to Mass. So she went once a month, right? What use is a Sunday obligation in a culture where that is what it means to go to Mass? Then everyone is a bad Catholic? Right? No. There have to be some things that are priorities and some things that are just cultural accommodations. And maybe the Sunday obligation is the cultural accommodation. <laughs> right? Maybe that is the, the let and maybe we can go back to a different way of doing it. I'm not saying don't go to Mass. It's very important that you go to Mass. <laughs> I want to be very clear, especially for the grandchildren in the room, that everyone has to go to Mass on Sundays. <laughs> but 
we should be aware that there are not only potentially different ways of living out Catholicism, but that there are already and have been for many years different ways of organizing the church that have been successful. And the Amazon Synod has really revealed that to me. exactly the kind of interaction that we can have using art as a source of the sense of the faith, right? Because there you've highlighted something that wasn't apparent to me, even though my grandmother worked in a factory when she came to this country. That's why she had that sewing machine. Um, because it, it highlights this whole other aspect of the way holiness operates in people who are forgotten or erased, right? Or who are done, who suffer violence. Right, at the border or near the border, right, all the feminicides, all of that is also contained in these pictures, mm -hmm. right? And, and the glasses that we bring to it, the glasses of our own experience, of our experience of holiness in the everyday, enrich our understanding of what it means to be church, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's through the understanding of grace or through a moral imperative, mm -hmm. like you're pointing out, that's just a really rich conversation. And so I really want to thank you for that. Well, I have a feeling there's many more topics we could discuss, but we're going to break the formal part of the gathering, and uh, let's once again, well, thank you for coming, and let's thank uh, Dr. Imperatory Lee. Very much.